Hi, I'm Dan Cooper. Some folks know me as D.B. Cooper. You might recognize me as the world's most famous skyjacker. In 1971, I hijacked Northwest Flight 305, demanded $200,000, and bailed mid-flight never to be found. But uh, look, I'm kind of in the middle of something, and you're in for a ridiculously long video. So I'll be turning it over to your hostess with the leastest, History Maven. So long, suckers. Oh, okay, thanks. Good luck with that, you know, jumping all, Mr. Cooper. Oh, and welcome to you. I'm the History Maven, and today I'm coming heavy with the theories, the clues, the suspects, and yes, the speculation. We're going to do our damnedest to get to the bottom of who the hell, why the hell, and where the hell is D.B. Cooper. As we investigate, we will score our most convincing suspects based on our fact checklist. And then we will speculate on some other clues, ideas, and tips about the skyjacking man of mystery. But first... You have to understand what, for lack of a better word, a shit show 1971 was, especially in the airline industry. Between 1968 through 1972, 130 skyjacking attempts were made around the globe. Most of these were disenfranchised, romantic young souls trying to get to Cuba to aid that Havana hottie Fidel Castro. They were fueled by desperation. They were well, desperate to find a place where they could belong and live in harmony. Some were just desperate to get to wear that really cool edgy facial hair and the cool patrol caps that became synonymous with that communist leader. But many others were just trying to hijack to Cuba because they simply had nowhere else to go. Desperation was also the key word in the 1970 air piracy incident in which a World War II vet, Arthur G. Berkeley, thought that he had been screwed by the IRS on his income taxes. So he did what anyone would do. He boarded a plane with a straight razor and a gun. Oh, Arthur. Arthur demanded $100 million from the Supreme Court's budget. As the crew tried to take him down, he was shouting that he was a slave to the government. Oh, goodness. Pulling out his pistol, Barkley turned to the flight crew and asked, What's the deal with airplane food? No, no, seriously, he announced no man should die alone, meaning that he intended to take out everyone on that plane, and he shot the captain, who fortunately survived. Arthur spent the rest of his days in a psychiatric hospital, but hey, at least he didn't have to worry about paying his taxes anymore. As fascinating as it is hearing about these cases, there's only one hijacker you want to hear about. So tighten your little bib, baby, because today's theories are juicy. But quick disclaimer time. This video is for entertainment purposes only. No one was ever charged in connection to Norjack, nor of these people actually considered suspects today. Six months after D.B. Cooper hijacked Northwest Flight 305, a man who looked nearly identical to the police sketches of Cooper boarded a Boeing 727 in Newark, New Jersey, pulled out two pistols, plastic explosives, and a hand grenade, and he gave the flight attendant a note showing his solitary demand, $500,000. After he secured his cash, he popped on a jumpsuit, opened the aft stairs, and much in the way Cooper had, he disappeared into the cloudy sky. However, unlike Cooper, he was seen again. He was standing in front of a fast food restaurant wearing a jumpsuit and holding a duffel bag when he waved down a ride from a Good Samaritan. When that Good Samaritan heard about the hijacking on TV that night, he about choked on a Salisbury steak. And then he, well, he routed out the hijacker in a hurry, wouldn't you? The air pirate turned out to be Richard Floyd McCoy Jr., a Mormon Sunday school teacher and law enforcement student. I know, right? The police found most of the money and other incriminating evidence from the hijacking in McCoy's house. Richard McCoy was sentenced to life in prison, but McCoy had nerve to spare and little to lose. He escaped from prison and he later died in a shootout with police. The similar nature of the crime and physical descriptions, well, they're there. But McCoy always firmly denied being D.B. Cooper. Let's talk about why McCoy may not have been Cooper by looking at our checklist. Physically, 
Cooper and McCoy weren't so alike as they appeared at first glance. McCoy was considerably younger at 29 years old than Cooper was said to be. He was blue-eyed and more fair-skinned than Cooper, and McCoy actually had light brown hair while Cooper's was nearly black. And furthermore, the flight attendants from the D.B. Cooper hijacking said McCoy was not the one that they were that they had been hijacked by when they were showing photos. Now, many informants came forward to say that McCoy was telling everyone his plan beforehand. Boy, he had a big old mouth. He even asked his sister-in-law to help him in the hijacking. The Vietnam War gave McCoy experience as a helicopter pilot and a parachutist where he was bravely swooping into war zones and well, rescuing everybody. Also, he had taken about 30 skydiving lessons prior to his 1972 hijacking, so he gets points on our score sheet for that for sure. An analysis of the tie that D.B. Cooper left on the plane when he jumped showed pure titanium particles that indicate he probably worked in metal manufacturing. This type of metal was used in railroad and military craft production. The fact that Cooper was wearing a tie to his J-O-B indicated that he was a manager or engineer where he was coming into contact with titanium fabrication, probably with a company that had some connection to Boeing. Maybe. McCoy had spent much of his 20s in the military. He was a student and supporting his wife and two children with National Guard pay and wages made from the Church of Latter-day Saints. There's no evidence he ever worked in a factory or as an engineer. D.B. Cooper was said to speak in a non-regional accent, and McCoy grew up in North Carolina. I lived in North Carolina for some years, and I can tell you, they have accents. Let's talk about Cooper's grudge. Cooper allegedly told the flight attendant assisting him during his 1971 hijacking that he had a grudge, or others have said that he had a grudge against airlines. McCoy was hard up for cash, I mean, for sure, but he never made a mention of a grudge. Cooper's height was described by eyewitnesses as being on the taller side for a man in the 1970s, so somewhere between 5'10 and 6'1. McCoy's wanted poster, it lists him as 5'10. McCoy must have been as captivated by D.B. Cooper's stunt as the rest of the world, but for McCoy, daydreaming about pulling off a hijacking evolved into a high-level crime. Based on our checklist... Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. gets a suspect score of 25 out of 100, meaning there is only a small chance that McCoy was also D.B. Cooper. I know what you were thinking. That was a bloody long analysis for one dude, but fear not. Now that we know what traits we're looking for in our suspects, we're going to zip right through these men and a woman. Barb Dayton may have worked in the University of Washington's library, but she was not just another meek book pusher, no, no. She had a past as a construction worker, a parachutist, and a pilot. She was a bold soul, having been the first gender confirmation surgery recipient in Washington State. Barb's friends, Pat and Ron Foreman, were teasing her one day, saying, oh, you look like D.B. Cooper. <laughs> Great, how nice of them. And that led her to break down and confess to them that she had donned men's clothing and paraded as Dan Cooper in order to hijack that Boeing 2727. She told her friends that she buried the ransom money near Portland. The later, she gambled some of it away. Even Barb's family members believed this theory, but the FBI discredited it, saying that Barb had recanted the story to them. But let's see how Barb stacks up on our checklist. Now, Barb did have flight and skydiving experience. She had tried to get her commercial license and failed, so we can consider that check a possible grudge and that she might have possibly worked around Boeing's as a result of her training. Growing up in the Pacific Northwest probably meant that her accent would be undetectable to people in Washington where the Cooper incident occurred. But she did not work in manufacturing. She did not have dark hair or eyes, and Barb was said to be fairly petite. That gives our little librarian lady a score of 50%. The favored suspect these days has to be Robert Rackstraw. Let's put Rackstraw to the rack, so to speak. Rackstraw was no Sunday school teacher, and he was no librarian. He had a long rap sheet of offenses like theft 
and trying to fake his own death in an insurance scam, allegedly of course. He was usually able to finagle an acquittal as in the case of where he was accused of murdering his stepfather, allegedly. But Robert was a complex guy. I mean, sure, he was involved in criminal acts beginning in his teen years, allegedly. But he was also a third place checker winner, a decorated Cub Scout, and later a decorated war hero. Throughout his life, he took on every contest, every club, and every opportunity he encountered. Rackstraw was questioned in the hijacking because he was an air duel with paratrooper and explosives training. And being a man who liked to kick up a little storm, he would play along with these people who believed he was Cooper or CIA agent. He would sometimes deny these accusations, but always with a little bit of a wink. Several letters were sent from people claiming to be Cooper and teasing out clues. One 1972 later was later decoded by Rick Sherwood, and he said that the letter gives Rackstraw's name in the code. <gasps> well, okay, Rackstraw's D.B. Cooper then. That's great, we know. I mean, didn't he practically admit it? Well, I didn't see any code in the letter that allegedly pointed the finger at Rackstraw. And ultimately, Rackstraw stated that he was not the man responsible for Norjack. And the fact that he was possibly two decades younger than Cooper was said to be in his mid-40s makes me question it. And on top of that, those flight attendants, they said that was not a match. Robert was not D.B. Cooper. Now, Ro Robert Rackstraw has the eye color. He has the height, 5'11", falling within D.B. Cooper's range. And you know what? He was kicked out of the Army. And some could view that as a grudge against Uncle Sam. Maybe that caused him to go all air pirate. I don't know if I agree completely, but I will concede that point. Rackstraw did not work in manufacturing, though. He did not have any ties to Boeing. And watching videos of Mr. Rackstraw, I thought I detected a slight Midwestern accent. Though I don't know if he'd pick up on it in a high-intensity situation. And one D.B. Cooper witness actually said, Hey, I think I hear a little Midwestern accent in there. So it's possible. But I am going to let you judge for yourself from this clip from a 2013 interview. Accent or no? But first, let me warn you that it's very short. Because I don't want to get copyrighted. Give it a listen. But you know what? Holy hot dogs. His score based on our checklist bumps him to the head of the class at a score of 75. I must add a footnote on Rock, Rack Straw though that the flight attendant in Norjack describes Cooper as a calm executive type. And in his youth, Rack Straw had what only could be called, I want to call it Chad energy. That man could have taken a handful of horse tranquilizers in order to be calm. That was the only way it was going to happen. But hey, I could be wrong. You have to be pretty level-headed to win third place in a checkers tournament. Let's talk about Sheridan Peterson. He was a parachuting firefighter who became a D.B. Cooper suspect because to National Magazines he said things such as, Actually, the FBI has good reason to suspect me. There were too many circumstances involved for it to be a coincidence. Oh, Sheridan. Peterson was 44 at the time of the hijacking and admitted that there was even a training photo of him jumping out of a Boeing in a suit and tie like D.B. Cooper. But Peterson was another blue-eyed boy. And not to be disrespectful, because Mr. Peterson seemed like a cool, attractive guy regardless, but he did appear to have a cock eye in his photos, which I think witnesses would have mentioned if D.B. Cooper had the same affliction. Are you guys seeing this or are my eyes playing tricks on me? Well, anyway, an even bigger eliminating factor was that Peterson was in Nepal during the hijacking. Some say dude just got a kick out of attention. He didn't work in medals. He was a journalist. When hearing the accusation that her ex-husband was suspected of being D.B. Cooper, Sheridan's ex-wife said, Hmm, that sounds like something he would do. Now, let's tally Peterson's score. His experience, lack of accent, and connection to Boeing and physical features give him a score of 62.5. Hey, not bad, Peterson. Not bad. Do you know how many dads and uncles confess to being D.B. Cooper? 
Too dang many. Most have been discredited through the partial DNA sample left on the plane back in 1971 by Cooper. Now, the FBI never questioned Gossett or considered Gossett a suspect in the 1970s, but Gossett sure kept telling his sons that he was the one, the only, D.B. Cooper. So, who was Gossett, and how did he get on the suspect list? William P. Gossett was a San Diego-born Marine who picked up a law degree in his spare time, though he stated in a 1962 article in the National Star News that he was more interested in pursuing education, politics, and writing than courtrooms. Maybe the interest in writing led Gossett to start spreading the story that he was D.B. Cooper. He once pulled out a newspaper clipping of Cooper from his file cabinet and asked his kids, Hey, who does this look like? He proceeded to tell them that he was the famous fugitive and that he had the money in a safe deposit box in Vancouver, British Columbia. He apparently told a lot of people this, including a judge friend of his who advised him that the best thing to do would be to stay quiet if that was true. Gossett's children were convinced and they contacted investigator and author Galen Cook. Cook actually noted that Gossett had history in the military and parachuting and, you know, he was the right age. But he spent most of his life as a desk jockey and a professor. And then, later as a priest and paranormal investigator, all of these things were under the name Wolfgang Gossett. He changed his name. Let's watch a little video clip of Mr. Wolfgang Gossett. Ooh, parapsychology sounds interesting, Mr. Gossett. Gossett wasn't even in the Pacific Northwest during November 1971 when the hijacking occurred. He was on schedule to work at a state college in Utah, which makes you wonder how he could hijack a plane which was over 700 miles away. It seems Gossett was a colorful character and a man with a fertile imagination, but was he D.B. Cooper? Hmm, let's test him out. William Gossett's appearance and time in the Marines lands him a total of... 62.5. William J. Smith was a New Jersey born yard master. Okay, that doesn't mean he was out riding lawnmowers and keeping the local high school football fields trim. Smith was a railroad man. Before he was bossing around Thomas the Tank Engine, he was actually an aerial photographer for the military. Word on the street is that a witness remarked that D.B. Cooper had a skin flap on his neck, or what you might call a turkey neck. Mmm, great. The way they were sucking down the cartons of Marlboro Red back then, everyone's skin had terrible elasticity. This means nothing. Cooper was allegedly said to also have a scar on his palm, and Smith also had these features. Cooper... DB, that is, was speculated to have been an engineer of or a manager in metal fabrication, as we mentioned before. And Smith, well, he wasn't an engineer, but he might have come into contact with this type of metal in the rail yard. Does that feel like a stretch, though? Maybe a little? Well, hey, let's not discount him completely. DB Cooper tie um, also contained 10 copper bromide and cobalt, which are used in film development among other applications. And we know Smith was a photographer, but he had more hair at the age of 93 than D.B. Cooper was said to have had at the time of the hijacking as a middle-aged man. But enough of these shenanigans. Let's get a score for Mr. Smith. With some physical features in common with Cooper, no accent, and some work experience in common, Smith also gets a 62.5 out of 10. Before we venture off into the land of theorizing and profiling, my favorite, we have a final suspect to discuss. And brother is a wild suspect indeed. Walter Recca was a Michigan-based freelance covert operative who worked with the CIA KGB, and MI6. That's actually true. He was an old friend and a skydiving buddy of a fellow named Carl Lauren, who always suspected that his friend was D.B. Cooper, and he eventually got him. 
to sign a little letter of admission. And Walter's niece, Lisa, she acted as a witness to this confession. Finally, we got it. Case closed, right? Yay, we know who did it. Well, let's go back to binge washing House of Dragon, shall we? Wait, what? He probably wasn't D.B. Cooper. Oh, no! Look, Carl and just about everybody else has written a book on their suspect of choice. I need to say someone in my family was D.B. Cooper so I can get paid. Anyway, I'll try to link these books in some reliable resources like D.B. Cooper Forum and Citizen Sleuths in the description box. But back to Walter Recca. Walter was born Walter Pekka, but he had to change his name because he was fleeing robbery charges, allegedly, and his wife and kids in Michigan. Recca certainly had the training to pull off a hijacking and the cojones to do it. But many of the details of the hijacking that Rekka conveyed to his friend were incorrect. Even the flight path he said that they took wasn't right. Rekka said he landed in a town called, okay, I don't know how to pronounce it, so we're going to call it Clellum, which is 100 miles south of Seattle. This was not supposed to be anywhere near the potential drop zone area for Cooper. Rekka said he had proof in the form of a witness who chatted with him as he showed up at the Clellum Diner in a wet jumpsuit with a wrapped up bundle under his arm. The witness, a former police officer, said he did indeed meet a man oh, about around 1971 who stumbled into the diner on a rainy night and asked him to call his friend, which he did. The witness said he saw the composite sketches of Cooper and it didn't look a ding dong dang doodle thing like Rekka, so he never thought that it was possible that the man that he met in the diner in Washington was the most famous fugitive. Rekka looks nothing like sketches of Cooper. Baldness never touched his magnificent mane, and Rekka never worked with titanium. I also read that he was an immigrant and had a notable accent. No reason for a grudge was ever mentioned, and that's a lot against the old Walter as D.B. Cooper theory. So how does Rekka stack up score-wise? Well, that stacks up to a score of a mere 37.5. None of the suspects made the mark on our checklist. It's likely D.B. Cooper took his secret to his grave, whether that was in the last few years or the night of the hijacking. This is the longest video, I swear, and I do apologize. If you are here, oh my gosh, you have a killer attention span, or you're just a glutton for punishment. Either way, I sure appreciate you very much. Stick with me. We aren't done with theories about D.B. Cooper quite yet. We have to dish about the theory that D.B. Cooper's a Zodiac killer or a co-pilot from that plane. Or that Cooper hit the ground a, a little too hard when bailing from the jet. And much more. The Zodiac killer was a serial murderer who was active in California in the late 1960s and early 1970s. He was notorious for sending coded notes and clues to the newspapers. Now, one theory that we've heard goes that the Zodiac Killer was in hiding and he needed a way to make money. So he hijacked the Boeing 727 before Thanksgiving in 1971. What ties the Zodiac Killer to D.B. Cooper? Not much. I mean, both allegedly wrote cryptic notes to newspapers and both were middle-aged, brunette, and never caught. The police sketches made them look similar but, you know, D.B. Cooper was a little thinner and in the Zodiac wore glasses when Cooper didn't. And the Zodiac was said to be violent while Cooper was supposed to be a gentleman, even when extorting an airline. Obviously, Dan Cooper was not the Zodiac killer. Eh, but there are some who say that the Flight 305 hijacker was never found because of something very different, a different theory. A theory that the hijacker was never found because the plane was never hijacked in the first place. You may have heard this theory. This theory sounds like all the rest presented here. It's only presented in good fun and not as an accusation. So uh, let's not get litigious up in here. The inside job theory sees co-pilot Bill, probably pronouncing it wrong, Ratichek, sitting in a main cabin seat in a business suit and acting the part of the hijacker and the crew acting out the motions of hijacking victims. 
Once the passengers are released, the co-pilot put on his airline uniform and sat in the cockpit. The flight attendant tossed out the parachutes and a stack of money to make it look as if Cooper had not survived his jump attempt. They had all intended to, you know, split the ransom. But once they learned that the bill's serial numbers were marked, they were way too scared to spend. They vowed to stick with their story about the mysterious Dan Cooper for the rest of their days. People noticed a resemblance between Ratajkowski and Cooper and conjured this tale. But like, come on now everybody, let's be for real. 50% of all Caucasian American men in the 1970s looked like D.B. Cooper. I'm sorry, it is true. Many were slim with dark slicked back hair and they wore suits. It was still pretty normal, especially for the 40 plus crowd in the early 70s. And you know that many people could not have stayed silent about a crime of this caliber for that long. That was too many involved parties. What's the saying? Two people can keep a secret if one of them is dead. There is no way at least one of the crew members wouldn't have gotten nervous and dropped a dime on the rest in a plea bargain. This theory is also nonsense, but come on, it's too fun not to share. A theory with a lot more credence is that D.B. Cooper was a victim of the Boeing bust. From 1969 to 1971, the Boeing company lost a lot of contracts and had to lay off an enormous number of workers. In 1971, the year of the hijacking, Boeing laid off 55,000 workers in Washington state alone, and executives had to take a 25% pay cut. Strikes and protests surrounded the Boeing properties. Washington experienced a huge an immediate dip in the population as many workers had to move out of state to find employment. The grudge that Cooper expressed, the particles on the tie, the familiarity with the aircraft, that all really could suggest that Cooper was one of the laid off workers. That would narrow down the list of potential suspects, but not as much as you think. Most of the Boeing engineers and managers were middle-aged white men, and because so many had been in World War II enlistees, many of them had military paratrooper experience. Browsing old photographs of Boeing plants for potential D.B. Coopers, I realized that just about every engineer at that time looked like D.B. Cooper. No wonder they never identified him. The citizen scientists known as the citizen salutes determined that Cooper was likely someone working in metal fabrication, remember? <laughs> and other investigators, well, they have theories too that the particles would have been found in train manufacturing facilities. You know, maybe one with a connection to Boeing. And in 1971, war was manufacturing rapid transit cars. These were automated trains being made for the city of San Diego. Oh, they also grabbed two aircraft contracts with Boeing in 1970 to make these propulsion pods for the SST. Oh, honey, the po that, that titanium, it was flying. It surely was. Both contracts, though, went bust faster than a virgin in a brothel. But despite layoffs and a few failures, war had a lengthy era of financial success in the transport business during the 1970s. Good for them, right? Yay, but what's the tie to our airborne outlaw, you may wonder? Let's take a look at the National City Star News from November 21st, 1971, just days before the hijacking. War Industries and the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, they were in dispute. One that eventually led to an intense 93-day strike at Roar. Over 3,000 union members demanded better pay. By December, things were getting ugly. Strikers were burning things. They were threatening the line crossers. Allegedly, police were manhandling the picketers. A strike, uh, you know, it sure would give the fella the time and motivation. Ooh, to say pull together his own severance package should he require it in this imagined fellow. Well, he'd be working around titanium and he'd have a grudge and uh, he'd have a work-based tie to you-know-who. Roar and the Union were battling it out in the streets and the court of public opinion. Literal shots were fired from the picket line. Man, I'm glad I wasn't there. The strikers, they were not receiving unemployment, so things had to be getting a little scant money-wise after weeks without income. The strike lasted until February of 1972. Another theory holds that the long-running French language comic Dan Cooper, aka 
Le Adventures de Dan Cooper, <laughs> excuse my French, <laughs> was first published in 1954, and it was about a Royal Canadian Air Force pilot. Um, a lot of people say there's a tie to Cooper here, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Was this a coincidence that the hijacker chose the name Dan Cooper as his synonym, or was this deliberate? If deliberate, this could mean that D.B. Cooper could speak Francois, and that he could read the comic, or it could just be that someone explained the character or comic to him, and he identified with Dan Cooper, comic book pilot and paratrooper, maybe so much that he adopted it for his name on the night of November 24th, 1971. If Cooper were a French-Canadian boy, it would be smart, well, it'd be smart not to commit air piracy, but if you were going to, doing it over the border of your own country, well, that would be reasonable. Most American suspects were studied and questioned, and he could have deflected a lot of federal heat this way. So, we might have a Canadian fellow on our hands, eh? Why would someone break the law and risk breaking his neck? The internet, actually, of course, it has a lot of ideas for this question. That maybe D.B. Cooper was escaping prison, his family, the mafia, or there was the idea he was grabbing money for a bigger cause, such as communism or the Black Panthers or a crime syndicate. Or maybe, like the previous hijackers, he felt like an outsider he was a soft-spoken man who kept to himself with no one to miss him, no one to look for him should he disappear into thin air. Was this just a big Hail Mary move from a guy who felt he had little to live for? A skull and parachute were found near Mount Hood in 1975. The FBI are not sure it was Cooper's. If you're wondering, like I was, how many dead parachuters there could be in Washington State or in Oregon? Oh, goodness, there's a lot in the Pacific Northwest, let me tell you. World War II in Vietnam introduced a lot of soldiers to parachuting, and so did the early 1960s TV show Ripcord, which introduced skydiving to thousands and thousands of young people, and it made it look like an incredibly badass sport. Digging through the 1960s and 70s newspapers, I found that the skydiving craze had become a national obsession with every parade, every fair, every halftime show featuring skydivers. Weekly newspapers were telling of skydivers who bounced, which meant they died after jumping. And some of those bodies of these fallen skydivers were just presumed dead because they were never recovered. Also, this skull found was an Estacada. It was found about 40 miles from the spot where a stack of Cooper's money was found in 1981, creating doubt that the skull was the fallen hijacker. With all the mountains and the thick forests of the Pacific Northwest, the area is a virtual Bermuda Triangle for pilots. Not only are there many pilots whose bodies were never recovered, there are whole planes that were never found or only found decades later recently. This shows there's truth to the FBI's original theory that D.B. Cooper's body was just lost in the pines of Oregon. Whether the skyjacking was done out of pure chutzpah or psychosis, that skull could very likely belong to Cooper. Experts analyzing the jump initially gave him a 50-50 chance of survival given the rough woodsy terrain and the near freezing temperature and one of the two parachutes that he jumped with being non-functional and his lack of proper jump gear. After years of analysis and evidence collection, they gave Cooper an even lower chance of survival. But, okay, let me contradict myself a little. Let's back it up. They say that Cooper jumped in just a regular business suit and his little penny loafers and no goggles. But I thought this is totally possible that he did have goggles or maybe even a tightly folded jumpsuit hidden under what was allegedly a bomb that was in his attache case. I mean, wouldn't you stash your stuff in the case to increase your chances of a comfortable landing? Cooper might have made up, he might have had more up his sleeve actually than we know. It could have been the difference between life and death. Okay, this has been, whew, this has been a ride, hasn't it? I'm flaky, so my feelings about the theories have been all over the place. But it's not me. Everyone in the world is confused. What happened to D.B. Cooper? He died. He didn't die. He's a soldier. He's a skydiver. He's another mentally ill hijacker. You're not supposed to introduce new ideas into a conclusion. But look, it's my video. I get to it's happening. I want to talk about the letters that came to several newspapers after the hijackings. And they were signed D.B. Cooper. Okay, it's my instinct to dismiss them, 
but at least one letter seems to contain very similar handwriting to the signature on the Northwest ticket that Cooper signed prior to boarding the plane that fateful day. Handwriting is not the be-all, end-all of verifying identity by any measure. But I love speculating, and I love this legend. So I want to take this as a sign of Cooper's survival. Let's assume all the letters are legitimate. The letter with the matching handwriting to Cooper's claim that he was watching the Grey Cup games. That is a championship of the Canadian Football League. It was in Vancouver. And in another letter, the author admits he was wearing a toupee and putty makeup during the hijacking. Okay, let's look at those clues. In case you're very young, Amazon.com was not around in the 1970s. So to get your hands on disguises would mean you had to live in a large city that harbored such specialty stores, or you ordered these things from the back of a comic book maybe, or if they were good enough to fool people, as in this case, that you were working in the entertainment industry with proximity to makeup and special effects, or you had a friend who was in that field doing that. Attending Canadian football games, being notably polite during the hijacking, speaking French in order to the, enjoy the Dan Cooper comic, these might suggest that D.B. Cooper was a Canadian citizen. Another letter specified Portland, Oregon as Cooper's hometown. I'll admit that, but the handwriting looked 0% like Cooper's. So I'm going to go with the Canadian theory. Doesn't it sound good? A Canadian daredevil skydiver who just got double dog dared to ransom a plane by his old buddies. They all got to quit their titanium factory day jobs and they spent the next few years glugging down all the Molsons they could drink and parachuting out of planes all day. <laughs> so where in the world is D.B. Cooper? Did he really spend his days going to games and clinking beers with his bros? You know I don't know, but it's a nicer scenario than another depressed businessman falling to his death and being buried under snow and brambles for all eternity. So this is what I'm going to choose to believe. A happy, successful Canadian daredevil. What we can assume from cases that have been recently solved by DNA is that if we ever do learn for real who D.B. Cooper really was, we're going to find out that it was someone who was never questioned. A man who had nothing to do with titanium particles or French comic books. Or Boeing, for that matter. You see how long this video was. Oh, you guys, I apologize. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Loves you so much. I could only give you what I thought was relevant. There are so many more suspects. And the hunt for the ransom. Oh, Netflix, get on this. It needs its own docuseries. This piss-poor video took three months to cobble together. I shit you not. Sad but true. If you want to investigate further, start with the links in the description. But I want to hear from you in the comments, please, everyone. Who do you think D.B. Cooper was? What important clues and suspects did I miss? I bet you have some thoughts on it. Talk to me, folks. And thank you for staying until the bitter end. As always, thank you for sticking around. And I wish you peace and love.